There are a lot of adult comedies in animation, but I don't think any cartoon executes the adult and the comedy quite like King of the Hill. It's a show that's not afraid to be crude or talk about explicit subject matter, but it also makes constructive social commentary through multi-dimensional characters. My name is Tom, and today I'm going to talk about one of my favorite shows of all time. That might come as a surprise to some and make perfect sense to others. It's no secret, I have a habit of being very political on main. The comment section for this one is gonna be nuts. So what does this have to do with King of the Hill? Well, King of the Hill's entire premise is immersed in socio-political framing. If you ask me to describe King of the Hill to someone who has never seen it, I would describe it as a white Texan man trying to live out the American dream as he is forced to confront the changing world at odds between his traditional conservative upbringing and sensibilities against his own moral compass, knowing what is right and what is wrong, and being put in situations where he has to reflect on the values that himself and his community tend to default to. And the fact that King of the Hill is a show centered around southern white rednecks can make it a tough sell to people who have never seen it before, and it's even gotten me some strange reactions, because how does someone who is extremely left like me match to identify with and invest in a show with an aesthetic of conservative values well for a few reasons for one it is kind of vindicating to see these characters slowly shift more socially left or at least become more accepting over time but more prominently i think it's class solidarity for me hank hill is a very honest and intelligent man who has a lot of values that feel outdated or are just straight up ignorant which is what makes him simultaneously hilarious and kind of endearing but despite being so social conservative, he's actually a lot more fiscally progressive than I think even most liberals. So before I get into the examples, I just want to Dog, what are you doing? I just want to preface that King of the Hill has had a ton of episodes, and there's no way within this time frame of the video I'm going to cover every single example. There are many politically charged episodes that I could dive into, but in order to dive into every single one, it would take forever. So instead, I opted to just go for the general idea of why is King of the Hill so political? What about the political framing actually makes King of the Hill a really great show? And why is it that people from all sides of the aisle are able to enjoy it to some degree? So I just kind of want to set the expectations very clearly right now because there are a lot of episodes that I wish I could have talked about, but there just wasn't enough time and I didn't want to end up working on this video for the next year. So I tried to focus on the general structure and recurring characters that have some sort of political message built into them. But without further ado, let's get back into it. Everybody knows that Hank Hill sells propane and propane accessories, and he loves it because Hank is passionate about the product he sells and the culture around it. Hank is not only a great salesman of propane, but he cares about the experience of his customers as well as his fellow workers. When a snowstorm hit Arlen and the people in charge wanted to price gouge since natural gas was in such high demand, Hank spoke up about how predatory it was. And in that specific case, Buck Strickland was in the hospital and had an interim head that didn't care for Hank, so it's not like Hank was in any position to speak up, but he did it anyways, because he cared that much about people over profits, which is pretty based. In the same episode, that interim leadership started putting trackers in the propane trucks to micromanage productivity, and Hank's stated reason for opposing that is because it was a measure that the union fought against. So I can't believe I almost forgot about this. Hank literally worked at a co-op in one episode. A co-op is a business model where all employees have a share in the business and share ownership over the means of production, also known as a wet dream for leftists trying to be ethical business owners. And it wasn't like him accidentally smoking weed, he joined a co-op because he agreed with their practices, most prominently the farming practices of their suppliers being far more ethical than megalomarts. And then when Hank's management skills led to an increase in revenue that went back into improving the business, it got the attention of megalomart, who offered to buy them out, and who was the only person who didn't want to accept the offer and give up on the principles of the business? Hank Hill. Which tells me that Hank does land a lot farther left in his values than even he realizes, as do most Americans if we're being honest. Now, I have this crazy worldview that as someone who is born, raised, and even still working class, I probably have a lot more in common than many want to admit, maybe even myself, with working class conservatives, even the ones that have very extreme social views. Because outside of social issues, I care about things like higher wages, universal health care, workers' unions, student debt forgiveness, maybe even universal basic income and free college. All things that would help the working class, including working class conservatives. Whether or not working class conservatives vote according to those interests is a different story. 
story, but I support those things with the belief it will help those people as well, if not more than myself. Also, giving people more comfortable and secure living conditions with higher accessibility up the social ladder cuts down on social tension. In fact, I think part of the reason why a show like King of the Hill was able to succeed when it did was because it was mostly airing during a time of relative economic stability, mostly taking place during and after the Clinton administration in one of the strongest points of economic expansion in US history, prior to the economic crash in 2008. And though the show was still on the air by then, most people interpret the timeline of the universe not going too deep into the 2000s, so we don't really see the effects of that downturn. And this matters because it might sound crazy, but people tend to be less reactionary and more open-minded when the threat of extreme poverty isn't constantly knocking on their door. That's why back then, even if the social platform of the Republican Party could be a bit concerning, there wasn't the same level of radicalization with movements like the Tea Party or QAnon bleeding into mainstream conservatism, which also plays into why King of the Hill socially works narratively. Even if the characters are Republican social conservatives, they exist in a time where that alone wasn't enough to be viewed as far right, even if Dale does show some of those tendencies at times. He might just be a libertarian though, with the way he feels about the government, but King of the Hill is such an honest portrayal of the American people that manages to be simultaneously critical and charitable, and not even always in a socio-political sense, just on a personal level. You can love or hate just about any character, but you have to see them for their character flaws as well as their humanity. Peggy Hill is a controversial character for the fact that she does have a lot of narcissistic tendencies. She has a massive ego and constantly tries to make everything about herself, but it is also understood that this comes from the walls she was faced with growing up as an ambitious girl who didn't meet the traditional standards of femininity. femininity. Why is that so hard to say? Femininity. <laughs> and that's kind of a mild example where you can acknowledge this is the case and decide for yourself that's something that greatly outweighs whatever negatives Peggy Hill might have. You might think it doesn't even pale in comparison. You might acknowledge that those things were unfair and it's admirable that Peggy came out the other side as successful as she is, and you can also acknowledge at the same time how insufferable she is. Then you got someone like Cotton Hill, who was an abusive chauvinistic pig, yet still has redeeming qualities, mostly in regards to his relationship with his grandson, Bobby. Even for someone like myself who doesn't think Cotton's sympathetic moments outweigh the abuse he's put people through, I'd rather have those moments than not. Partly because it shows the range of Cotton's character, but also because it shows that someone as abrasive and grating as him is still just a pathetic old man at the end of the day. It shows that the cost of being a toxic little gremlin is living a sad life that even being a decorated war hero doesn't always make up for. Cotton is a more extreme example, but every character has some level of this duality. Every character makes mistakes and has low points, but they also have moments where they get to shine. And something I really appreciate is the fact that this isn't limited to white cast members. There's this weird idea that positive representation in media means you have to always have characters who are pure and clean, representing marginalized groups, which, with all due respect, is dumb. If that was the attitude in King of the Hill, you'd be taking away from those characters everything I just described. Khan, for example. He's an asshole, just straight up. He's one of the most obnoxious characters in the show, and I love it. Let him be an asshole. What the hell kind of country is this where I can only hate a man if he's white? Let Min be a passive-aggressive snob. It doesn't change the fact that the Super Nusen phones are a social commentary on the model minority myth, commonly attributed to Asian Americans, coming into a southern white community being met with racism from the jump and feeling the need to prove that they are better than their white neighbors just to be allowed to exist in their community. A point where this theme was very present was when Khan and Min were trying to get Connie into a college summer school, but because of the model minority thing working against Asians when it comes to affirmative action, Connie got denied despite her exceptional credentials. And no matter how hard I work or how hard Connie studies, we all just stuck here. Leading Khan to spiral into a hillbilly lifestyle, pulling Min down with him in a rebellion against the expectations of being an Asian American held to unrealistic standards of excellence. And this was an episode that used a systemic issue to create a situation that told us a lot about each member of the Super Nusen phone family. And in my research, I also found that Khan is actually meant to be a lot more conservative than his neighbors, which makes a lot of sense. What most people don't realize is there are a lot of immigrants, especially from Khan's generation, who hold very hard conservative beliefs. That's usually what draws them here in the first place. Part of it is also a fact that they usually come from authoritarian governments that mimic a lot of left-wing economic policies, so America providing the opposite of that is a sanctuary in comparison. But that's also partly because America can't let a far-left populist leader be democratically elected and stay in power in any country we have any power to destabilize at a moment's notice, but I ain't gonna have that conversation in a video about Canada Hill. As the Super Nusen phones assimilate over the course of the series and their white neighbors who have never been exposed to Asian Americans on a personal level have the opportunity to know them and see them for who they are, eventually they are not so much disliked for the color of their skin, but for the content of their character, the American dream. Unironically, I think Canada Hill is one of the better examples of representation 
representation for Asian Americans. Similarly, it puts a lot more efforts than most into portraying what it's like to be Native American. John Redcorn tends to be a pretty unlikable character for most, from the fact that the entire premise of his character is that Dale's wife Nancy is having an affair with him, and he is the legitimate father of Nancy and Dale's son Joseph. John Redcorn embodies a different stereotype in the way that black and indigenous men tend to be fetishized, sexualized, and objectified, not just by white people, but usually by white people. And maybe I just have a different view on John Redcorn since I'm inclined to identify with him for reasons, but I see his relationship with Nancy a bit differently than most. And I don't really vibe with how quickly people jump to demonize him. I actually did the math based on inconsistent numbers, to be honest. What if John Redcorn finds out? 14 years we've been together and I throw it all away. I'm 36 years old. I don't need this crap. Nancy would have started her affair when she was in her early 30s, and John Redcorn would have been in his early 20s, which isn't illegal or anything, but the thought of a married woman in her 30s hooking up with someone my age does set off some alarms. Like, if that was my homie, I would be concerned. Not that I'm saying John Redcorn is the victim or anything, he was definitely complicit, but I definitely think Nancy holds more responsibility for a situation relative to John Redcorn. I actually do feel for John, who seems to feel used, and has a son where he is barely able to be a part of his life, let alone have an opportunity to raise him. And yet, yeah, it's a situation of you reap what you sow, but it still sucks, as is the duality of King of the Hill. But I definitely identify more of Joseph than John Redcorn for a variety of reasons. Partly because I watched a lot of King of the Hill as I was becoming a teenager, so I did identify more of the kids than the adults. And also because I relate a lot more to being a native kid growing up with a quote-unquote white experience than being a native who grew up within the culture. And then there's a whole there being hundreds of tribes with different cultures and it's a whole thing. So the closest I've got to actual rep is Joseph, who has been socialized with this weird you're white but also you're not white thing that I also grew up with. I feel like saying I've never seen a show portray that specific experience of mine would be an understatement because my expectations wouldn't even be high enough to expect that specific experience in the first place. And it's really funny how I say this and think about how I tell people this is one of my favorite shows and they're like, how is this one of your favorite shows about a bunch of hillbillies? That don't make any sense. Well, let's bring it back to that point because let's be honest, the characters I'm talking about make up a a fraction of the show. Even though I like what they contribute, and they are good examples of how the characters exist in Shades of Grey in a lot of ways, King of the Hill is about the king himself, Hank Hill and his family. And the thing about Hank is you can tell he's a smart guy and has a lot of common sense and positive values, but because of the culture and environment he was raised in between straight-laced but sometimes backward southern values that have their pros and cons, on top of the trauma of trying to live up to Cotton's hypermasculine expectations, he has a lot to work through. I know some people might think I'm implying that somehow what I think is right and what Hank thinks is wrong, but I think everyone has a lot of assumptions about the world and the way things are or will be that might change when you actually confront those things in real life. And King of the Hill is about Hank confronting those things and usually changing his mind. It's just a coming of age story for a middle aged man who seems stuck in his ways but still finds himself learning and growing, especially when it comes to his son Bobby. Now, there are some amazing videos out there covering Hank and Bobby's relationship and how it contributes to both their growth, and by some amazing videos, I mean this one, but I want to discuss more why this happens than how. Bobby is a foil to Hank in the way that he represents youth that is bright-eyed, open-minded, and idealistic. Meanwhile, Hank is older, wiser, but jaded. A lot of Hank's ignorance comes from the fact that he has very stern beliefs informed by the environment he was raised in. He had to find value in the expectations of the world around him, which came from being a star football player, being good with his hands, and being an all-around hard worker. To some degree, I do get the sense that Hank does look down on or maybe even resent others who didn't come from such harsh situations that would have pushed them the way he was. So when you look at Bobby who had a much better environment to come up in, he doesn't feel the same need to seek out validation from his interests and has the luxury of following comedy because it calls to him, which is something that Hank has trouble accepting for most of the series. And the relationship between Bobby and Hank is awesome because as much as they are different, the fact that their father and son puts an intrinsic desire into both of them to bond. Actually no, I want to give Hank more credit than that. Most of the mutual desire comes from the fact that Hank wants to be a good father to Bobby, and Bobby knows that even if Hank gets angry with him or doesn't understand him, his father only wants what's best for him at the end of the day. The effect of that is that Bobby learns real life skills from his father like the value of hard work, and Hank gets to experience the world beyond his otherwise narrow point of view, making him more tolerant to change over time. And as these things unfold, Hank and Bobby become closer. But even in these cases, the text never portrays things with a broad stroke. Though change can be good, there are times where it's not practical. 
practical or needs to be reined in. And though honest work is an objectively good value, there are times in the system we live under where you are going to be exploited and you need to stick up for yourself. So when it comes to the political framing of King of the Hill, I think the point is to elaborate on different perspectives so they're understood without being preached. The fact it's a fictional universe makes it so characters get the charitability to be unlikable, yet to hurt out for what they believe, where they came from, and what's important to them. And sometimes those things might align with you even if you don't think you'd agree. That's why I also think King of the Hill is a great example of adult animation. Because to fully appreciate the story, you need to be mature enough to at least pick up on and be open to that nuance, even if you don't fully understand it. I also think the practice of understanding people you might not like or agree with, even if it doesn't change your stance on them, is an important practice and seeing those people move more towards your own values, or potentially even showing you the value of a different point of view, just makes for satisfying storytelling. So anyways, I want to hear what you think. Let us know in the comments below, find me at TommyPQM on Twitter, Instagram, and Twitch, and find the Roundtable across the web at Roundtable Vids. If you enjoyed the video, give it a like, share it with your friends, subscribe, and hit the bell for more cartoon content. Thank you so much for watching, my name is Tom, and I hope you have an awesome day. See ya! The Late Night Sugma program will be every Friday for the next 10 weeks. 